Besides the controllers, the most loved Sega accessory has to be the VMU. For the uninitiated, the visual memory unit was the default first-party memory card for the Dreamcast. In addition to storing memories for games, it had a screen, a little speaker, and even some buttons. While some of these features would be used during gameplay, the VMU actually had its own library of games. I thought it might be fun to go through some of them to see how they measure up. The first bit of VMU software that I'd like to cover is for the game Cardcaptor Sakura Tomoyo no Video Daisakusen. This game can install not one, not two, not three, but four clocks onto your VMU. For some reason, this was surprisingly popular. I guess Sega really wanted you to take the VMU out on the go. However, it contains a version of the old classic Breakout. And I can't say I'd recommend this version. Instead of using left and right to go left and right, you have to use the A and B buttons. Pressing up launches the ball. Of all the ways I can think about playing Breakout, this is probably the worst one. Unfortunately, there weren't a lot of RPGs for the Dreamcast, but probably the most well-known one was Skies of Arcadia, which is an absolute banger. I streamed this one a while back and I had a blast. It was really refreshing to play an RPG where all of the characters are really optimistic despite the troubles they faced. Anyways, you encounter a character in the game called Pinta, and Pinta can go on his own quest. Hence the VMU game, Pinta's Quest. You can control Pinta's ship looking for treasure. And what's really cool is that the items that you find in the VMU game can be transferred back to the main game, which is really neat, but if you're lazy, you can still beat the game without it. Power Stone is another beloved Dreamcast classic, and it would have several mini games for the VMU. The first is Falcon's Aerial Adventure. You're piloting a ship and you gotta avoid bombs. It seems super weird to me that I couldn't shoot, but maybe that would have been too much for the VMU to handle. It's okay, but it gets boring really quick. The next would be Ayame's Shuriken Training. You have to throw shuriken at guys. I'd probably say out of all the mini games I played for this video, this one was my favorite. The final mini game would be Gunrock's Gun Gun Slots. This game is literally just a slot machine. I don't really have much to say about that. <laughs> Power Stone would not be the only fighting game to have a VMU minigame collection. Soul Calibur! This Japanese release would also have three minigames for the VMU. In Voldo Panic, you control Voldo and you have to bounce what might be bombs off your belly to the other side of the screen. It's a really weird concept, but I do like the overly detailed sprite of Voldo crying when you lose. Word Scramble is sort of weird. It shows you a word, then presents a scrambled version, which you have to unscramble by swapping two letters at a time. I'm not sure if it's because of the emulator or the game actually chugs, but I found the controls to be super unresponsive. If the controls were fixed, this probably would have been my favorite game. The last Soul Calibur minigame, Cannon Dare, is sort of perplexing. You're tasked with shooting Astaroth out of a cannon. You have three tries, but there's eight fuses. Try to guess the right one! It seems pretty pointless, so I couldn't be bothered to try to get a win. The last game that we'll be covering is, oddly enough, another fighting game. Tech Romancer! What is it with fighting games and VMU minigame collections? The most bizarre minigame in this video has to be Love and Punches. You're supposed to punch girls for points? I, I don't really get it. Phantasm Unit is pretty similar to Falcon's Aerial Adventure, where you gotta dodge obstacles in a ship. You can press up and down to change the speed, but yeah, not much to this one. The final game is Rock, Paper, Scissors, which is just Rock, Paper, Scissors. You press A and B to select rock or paper. <laughs> That's it, it's, it's just Rock, Paper, Scissors. <laughs> There are a lot more bits of software for the VMU out there, and there's even a standalone emulator for playing these games. But I'll leave it here for Sega's little memory card that could. Most discussion of gaming markets comes down to Japan, the United States, and Europe. But there's a lot of other places in the world that have been playing games for a long time. The subject of this video will be covering one that you might not expect, Brazil. 
While the Famicom and the NES would vastly outsell the Master System in Japan and America, Sega's 8-bit system would have a much longer life in the largest country in South America. The first thing to understand about Brazil is that they have what is known as the Industrialized Product Tax. This tax mostly affects imports from other countries, and it was created in order to encourage domestic manufacturing. Unfortunately, this has had the effect of vastly inflating video game prices. Just for reference, the PS5 in the US goes for around $400, where in Brazil it's nearly twice as much at $815. This has always been the case since video games started taking off in the 80s, leading to a massive amount of video game piracy in the country. But that isn't to say that there weren't legal alternatives. Often foreign companies would work with a local company to produce their products domestically, thus avoiding the tax. Sega would work with Tektoy to do the strategy. In fact, Tektoy is still releasing Sega products to this very day, including Master System and Genesis-based consoles. This partnership was so successful that at one point, Tektoy had 80% of the Brazilian video game market share. Probably the coolest part of this partnership was that Brazil got games for the Master System that no other region received. Most of these were conversion of Game Gear games, but it's still really neat to see. These games would include Battletoads, Dynamite Heady, Earthworm Jim, Echo, Mortal Kombat 3, Sonic Blast, and most impressively, Street Fighter 2. Unfortunately, some of these games don't really run the best, but it's still really funny to see a Master System game have a release date of 1998, nearly 15 years after the original console release. So, if you've ever seen anybody playing a Master System game that's all in Portuguese, now you know why. When it comes to Sega, the first mascot that comes to mind is obviously Sonic the Hedgehog, but the company has had several mascots throughout the ages. While the Blue Blur was the primary mascot during the 16-bit era, when it came time for the next generation, a mainline Sonic game would not grace the Saturn. Why that is, is a different story for a different time. But while America got weird people with rings around their head, Japan was very different. The Japanese Saturn would have its own symbol, Sagata Sinshiro. Sagata Sanshiro was a badass judo master that was obsessed with playing the Sega Saturn. It didn't matter if you were going to play baseball, hitting the club, or even celebrating Christmas. If you hadn't been playing your Sega Saturn seriously, he would hunt you down. The first thing that's really cool about Sagata is that his name has like three meanings. Sagata Sanshiro sounds super similar to his catchphrase, Sega Satan Shio, which literally translates into you must play the Sega Saturn. It also sort of sounds like Sega Saturn Shiro, which means White Sega Saturn. While the US only got the Saturn in black, it got a white version in Japan. The last meaning is a reference to famous Japanese director Akira Kurosawa's first movie, Sanshiro Sugata, which was based off of the real-life judo master Saigo Shiro. Sagata Sanshiro was portrayed by Hiroshi Fukioka. Tokusatsu fans might be quick to point out that Fukioka-san was the original common writer. Tokusatsu isn't really well known outside of Japan, besides the Power Rangers, but in the genre, common writer is way up there in popularity. It's also no coincidence that Sagata Sanshiro's theme song sounds oddly like the common writer theme. <laughs> The mascot would be so popular that eventually he'd get his own game, Sagata Senshiro Shinken Yugi. It's pretty trash though, so I wouldn't recommend playing it. If you haven't seen the commercials before, they're pretty insane. He's throwing people and making them explode, flirting with Sakura from Sakura Wars under cherry blossoms, and even doing a training montage with a huge Sega Saturn. It's definitely worth the 20 minutes or so to watch them all. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end, and Sagata's final commercial would be announcing the Dreamcast as well as his own game, and the plot is a doozy. While Sega HQ is having a meeting about the Dreamcast, some terrorist launches a missile. 
Sagata selflessly deflects the missile, saving Sega for another day. But this wouldn't be the end for Sagata. He'd have a cameo in Rent a Hero for the Dreamcast, where he teaches players techniques. He'd also show up in Project X Zone 2, where the entirety of the Sakura Wars commercial is reenacted. But the most relevant cameo to this festival would be his appearance in Sega All Stars Racing Transform, specifically in the Race of Ages, where he can be seen still riding that missile and keeping Sega safe. And that is the tale of Sagata Sanshiro. One of the things that's sometimes attributed with the success of the PlayStation 1 and the downfall of the N64 was the cartridge format. While cartridges have certain benefits, like fast load times, the cost of manufacturing a cartridge is much more expensive. This is why the vast majority of consoles since the fifth generation have used some sort of optical disc media until recently with the decreasing cost of flash memory. However, long ago, Sega dreamed of a way to reduce the cost of cartridge. Enter Sega My Card. The original My Card was released for the first Sega console, the SG-1000. The basic idea was to put a ROM on a cheaper to manufacture a card that consumers would buy more of. However, you would need to use the card catcher accessory to fit the cards into the console's cartridge slot. If you bought a card without the accessory, you could mail Sega to get the card catcher for free. I'm guessing that eventually Sega wanted to stop sending out accessories, so both the Mark III and the Master System would include a built-in card reader. But this isn't the only thing that the Mark III would bring, as there would be an updated version of My Card. The My Card Mark III, also known in America as the Sega Card. Unfortunately, the new format would be region locked, but the cards would also work on Sega's next console, the Genesis, with the power base converter add-on. This bit of hardware is actually just a passive pass-through to the Genesis, but it's still pretty neat. Eagle Eye gamers might notice that both iterations of my card look very similar to the turbo chips used by the TurboGrafx-16, and this is no coincidence. It turns out that Mitsubishi Plastics would work with both Sega and Hudson to produce these cards, but both of them are actually predated by Hudson's B card for the MSX line of home computers. The B card worked pretty much the same way as my card, where it's uh, slotted into a cartridge that the system can then read. Unfortunately, Hudson was the only one who used that format for the MSX, but the MSX is a different story entirely. While the card games were much less expensive, they didn't really catch on with consumers. The other issue is that gradually games got bigger and bigger, so they couldn't really fit onto the small cards. I think this is probably the reason that the CD attachment for the PC Engine was so popular compared with the Sega iteration. And that's it for Sega My Card. A lot of people have fond memories of Sega's home consoles, but even more might be familiar with Sega's arcade releases. It may be surprising to some, but there was a strong link between the two sides of Sega's game division. In fact, having an easy porting path from arcade hits to home console versions was a key part of Sega's success. In this episode, I want to talk a little bit about Sega's arcade systems that were designed with this path in mind. The first Sega console that made it outside of Japan would be the Master System, and the corresponding arcade board would be the Sega System E. The System E would have the same Zilog 80 as the CPU, but better hardware for the graphics. Unfortunately, it didn't get a lot of games, so there's not much to say. The Genesis would actually get three different arcade systems. The Sega System C is largely based off of the same hardware, but there are a couple of changes that make it incompatible. Notably, they removed the Z80 processor, but upclocked the other CPU to make up for it. The graphics hardware was split up in order to handle more sprites. 
There was a successor called the C2 that added an extra chip for playing audio samples. Some of the more famous games for the System C were Columns, Puyo Puyo, and everybody's favorite, Waku Waku Sonic Patrol Car. People who nerd out about video game history might be familiar with Nintendo's Play Choice 10 cabinets, which lets players select from 10 games, all which come on ROMs that could be slotted in. Sega basically had the same idea with a Mega Tech system. However, the games would be on the same format as Japanese Mega Drive cartridges, and the Mega Tech could hold 8. Oddly, users wouldn't be charged for continues, but rather amount of time that could be used to play any game they wanted to. The Megatech would be succeeded by the Mega Play, which was only released in Europe and Asia. The Mega Play has half the games that the Megatech did at 4. The time system was also done away with, following the more traditional lives per credit system. Sega Saturn. The follow-up to the Genesis would be the Sega Saturn, which would have its own arcade system. Sega Titan Video. Unlike previous iterations, it was nearly identical to the Saturn, with the only difference being that Titan games came on ROMs. This led to a lot of arcade ports being very similar to their home console release. Ironically, Sega's last home console would be outlasted by its arcade counterparts, of which there are many. The first was the Sega Naomi. The Naomi would have the same CPU at the same frequency, but it would have four times as much memory, faster graphics processor, and faster VRAM. Interestingly enough, you could combine several Naomi systems to get better performance. The biggest difference is that Naomi games were primarily distributed on ROMs instead of discs. However, a GD-ROM attachment would be released, letting Naomi systems run on the same GD-ROM format as its home console counterpart. The Naomi 2 would be released three years after the original, and would have much more powerful hardware, notably including an additional CPU. However, it maintained backwards compatibility with the original. Like its predecessor, the Naomi 2 would also get a GD-ROM attachment in order to play disc-based games. The next Dreamcast-based system was the Atomus Wave. Interestingly enough, it was manufactured by Sammy. Once Sega merged with Sammy, Sega took over the project. It was much more cost-effective than the Naomi, coming in at half the price. One really cool thing to me is that there's a lot of fighting games that got released on this thing. Notably, Guilty Gear X 1.5, The Rumblefish 1 and 2, KO Off 11, among others. 10. Model, baby. The last Dream Chaos based system would be the Sega System SP. It was first released in 2004, but had games come out on it up until 2014. Instead of having a lot of components, it would have a system on a chip. Similar cutbacks to games would also happen, as they were distributed on compact flashcards instead of ROMs or GD ROMs. While that would be the last of Sega's own consoles, Sega would actually make arcade hardware based on two other consoles. The first would be the Triforce, which would be based off of the Nintendo GameCube. It was actually a project that also included Namco. Three companies, Triforce, get it? To say that the Triforce is based off the GameCube is a little bit of an understatement. It literally uses the stock Japanese GameCube motherboard. There's a couple of other boards included, so it's not just a GameCube, but it's still wild to see Sega make a Nintendo arcade machine. The final arcade system would be the Sega Chihiro, which is based off of the original Microsoft Xbox. This is much less of a surprise considering that Sega was in a lot of talks with Microsoft when the Dreamcast was going under. Compared to the Xbox, the Chihiro uses the same CPU and graphics card, but it uses Sega's GD-ROM instead of DVDs. It also has more RAM, but other than that, it's the same as the standard Xbox. Well, I hope you guys found this little arcade trip interesting. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye!